So you're all welcome to uh, the next uh, roundtable discussion. And the topic of, this, of today's roundtable will be focused on Web3 workforce. How do you navigate the regulatory and tax landscapes of working in Web3? Um, our conversation today, excuse me, our conversation today is gonna be focused on decentralized autonomous organizations. So how do you walk by the tax and the regulatory landscapes uh, when it comes to DAO management, DAO payments to your contributors, and the legal structure for DAO uh, management, basically. Uh, and to answer this, today I have a panel of uh, three lawyers and a researcher. <laughs> I have uh, Sabine Van Heck Lepic yes. beside me. I also have Sharin Hosni, and I have Anu Twati. Uh, I'm going to give each of them one minute briefly to introduce themselves, what they do, and then we'll kick off uh, the roundtable session. Uh, you can go on. Okay, so I am a lawyer and searcher in law in Sciences Po Paris, and uh, I uh, am specialized in new technology and uh, contracts, and uh, I am president of uh, Logion Infrastructure, which is a blockchain, a legal blockchain. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Sherine Osni uh, and I am a tax lawyer. Uh, so we work mainly uh, on uh, issues regarding uh, entities or projects that are related to the blockchain or the cryptocurrencies ecosystem, but we apprehend them from a tax point of view. So what are their tax liabilities, tax risks, and also we accompany them in case they have any issues with the tax administration. Um, hello everybody, very nice to meet you uh, today. My name is Arnaud Twati, I'm uh, actually a founding partner of a law firm which is, name is Hashtag Avocat, which is actually specialized in new technologies. And uh, Web3 is actually like a huge part of our activity, approximately 80, from 90 to 80, 90% right now. Um, we're actually working in, in regulatory, mainly, but not only, we have like uh, um, a big part of our activity which is dedicated to the regulation of the DAO, so that's why I'm here today. Um, and uh, hopefully we are bringing you uh, a lot of uh, interesting information regarding your own activity today. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to start off first um, with Sabine. So we all understand the concept of a DAO, right? I assume everyone understands what a DAO is. Good. And each DAO has a legal structure, or maybe not. So I'm going to ask you, Sabine, what is a Maverick DAO? Uh, could you explain this concept to us, please? Yes, okay. So the notion of DAO, DAO is uh, uh, not a traditional company. Let's start with DAO to do that we can compare, compare traditional company. Uh, so traditional company is Yeri hierarchical organization and uh, management and uh, outside investor. Uh, and the law defines the relationship uh, in the company and the relationship with the company, okay? And the DAO is no hierarchy, no specific person, defined in DAO like a smart contract, smart contract of governance, and we have two types of DAO. First, it's incorporated under the law of a state. It's, uh, that means DAO regulated DAO, qualified as a company under the law and linked to the state. And we have Maverick DAO, les, les DAO hors la loi. So it's intrinsically international, it's constituted outside the law and uncertain legal qualification and DAO in an international context, DAO exists on an international network and the member can be resident from different states and the question of private international surrounding DAO and the question, the big question in can regulated DAO 
be recognized by the state, do Maverick Dao have a legal existence to state jurisdiction? So that is the subject. So legal and certainly, Dao exists in blockchain, you know that, okay? Open to all, it's hard to know who is the Dao, anybody from anywhere, it's difficult to identify who those specific member, so at the end, is really international. So the question is, DAO is a new form of company. And the question is, um, um, she, they, they will be uh, recognized by state. And if you look at Maverick DAO, the legal question will be, those organizations exist, have a legal existence. That is the question. And uh, the question, too, is code is law. And uh, indeed, the governance of DAO is defined by computer, by computer code, by smart contracts. The model law aims to provide a flexible legal framework tailored to the particular characteristic. And we clarify the DAO by the Koala model. It's, um, the name is a coalition of automated legal application, and that is a team of searchers, like uh, Primavera de Filippi, Florence Guillaume, and me, and, uh, and a lot of searchers, and we try to to conceptualize uh, the Maverick DAO and to propose a model koala, a model type for Maverick DAO, okay? So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're gonna come back to the issue of the koala uh, model yeah. and you would actually do a deep dive and explain to us how it works. Yeah. So now we understand like a Maverick DAOs are DAOs without a legal structure. So how can this be addressed? But you also have DAOs that have some sort of a legal structure and then comes my next question, which is directed to Arno. Uh, so Arno, could you please tell us what are the risks of a DAO being requalified as a de facto partnership? Well, um, I'm sorry, maybe I will do something unusual, but I would just ask the question to the public. Um, there is somebody here who has like a project with a DAO, who structurized his project with the AO? Okay, all right, very interesting. And what kind of model did you choose, actually? If you can just explain us an I will tell you why I'm asking you that question. Thank you. Yeah, sure, I understand. But uh, so, okay, so now, now you mean you didn't choose any model for now? Not for now. Okay, very interesting. Okay, sorry. I, I was sure you already choose a model. Okay, all right. So why I'm saying that? Just because, well, what I'm going to say is based on the French law, but technically I would say, I don't know where you come from, but I would say that probably you're going to have the same problems in case you don't choose a model, actually. So the idea is like, well, if you don't set up a business, a company, uh, your DAO, your, your structuration, which is not a structuration anyway, would be considered as a partnership, even if it's not a partnership itself. And it has a lot of consequences, like tax consequences, and Sharon, I'm sure, will explain you that, but not only, in terms of liability as well. Mm. Let's say, when you set up a business in France, you have like three criteria in order to consider that you have a corporation, okay? You need first to have the intention to collaborate together, all right? And it's worldwide, it's the same everywhere, right? Okay, secondly, you need to bring money, of course, to the company, money, or you mean to, to bring anything, but anyway, you, you need to bring something in common, okay? And you need to share losses and benefits, okay? But if you don't set up the business yourself, you could be, you could be considered as having like a de facto partnership, which means that you have a company, but without having technically a company. And in that case, you are fully liable as individual for everything's happened to the DAO. Which means that if anything happened and the liability of the DAO is looking for, 
there is no DL, which means that it's your personal liability. All right? So it's very risky, very dangerous. And that's why, even if there is no standard of model of DIO right now worldwide, we are trying, at least in France, to set up some kind of model which are definitely not perfect, but better than having nothing. And maybe, Sharon, you are going to say something about the tax consequences of, uh, of such kind of partnership? Uh, yeah, exactly. So w w whenever we have a DIO and we don't have like a legal wrapper or a legal entity that supports the project that is uh, conducted by the DIO, we uh, fall in the risk of having a de facto partnership, as Arnaud explained, uh, be constituted. So whenever that happens, and it doesn't happen like systematically, it's not because we have a DAO that we always have a de facto partnership, a risk of a, of a de facto partnership in France, but as, as Arnaud explained, there are certain uh, conditions, and when, once there are, those conditions are met, we have that risk. And what happens when we have that risk characterized is, uh, from a tax point of view, we have, uh, what happens is that we, are, we consider that the, is, there is a partnership, there is a company, and this company is liable to tax uh, responsibilities. So each year, the members should be uh, calculating their tax benefits, should be paying their taxes, which, like, in... in practice doesn't happen, like if someone doesn't uh, declare uh, like a legal company, they are not going to be uh, calculating their tax benefits, they are not going to be declaring their tax benefits, and uh, as they should. So what happens is that each member is going to be liable on their personal estate on the part of the taxes that uh, constitutes their participation in the DAO. So their participation in the DAO are gonna, is going to be calculated mostly uh, depending on the number of tokens that they have in the DAO. So now you're, you're going to be thinking, well, that does, that's not really practical because uh, the tokens are detained by wallets and the wallets are not like that we don't know who is behind the wallet. We don't know if someone has several wallets or if a wallet is repre represented by another entity which has several people. So this is where it becomes even more riskier for the founders of the DIO and not the regular members. So the founders are the people that are publicly, um, they are publicly known as the people who founded the DIO, who are the managers of the DIO. And what happens is that uh, instead of having each member liable for their parts of the profit, we're going to have a profit that is collectively, uh, like a taxes, uh, I'm sorry, that are collectively um, calculated on the level of the DAO as a company. So a company income tax that is going to be calculated. And it's the managers who will be uh, personally liable on their personal estate to uh, pay those uh, taxes. So for everyone for, for, for the whole benefits that is realized on the DAO each year. And we have um, like the Council of Estates, uh, the State Council has uh, ruled uh, that even if uh, the benefits are not distributed to the members of a de facto partnership, uh, the, part the, the members are still liable to pay taxes. So even if uh, those benefits stay invested in the DAO, uh, the members can still be uh, subject to having their liability engaged to pay taxes on benefits that they didn't even receive. So this is why we, also, we always say that it's so important to have this uh, like legal risk checked to see if the DAO is actually a de facto mem membership and to declare, uh, register an actual company to shield the, the estate and the responsibility of the members and especially the founders. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that clarifies um, a lot. My next question would be to Arno. Uh, you talked about the different models of the DAO that exist in France. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, what are the different models or legal wrappers that founders can consider when creating the DAO? And uh, based on that, I would like to ask Sharin the next question, which is, what task risks should founders take into account or should they be aware of while choosing a DAO model um, in France, I would say? Okay. So, um, basically, um, as I said earlier, and thank you very much, Sharon, for the precision, um, the, this is a necessity to really set up a structure in order to, 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 I mean, to have like, some, some liability 
from the structure and not individually. So this is really important to avoid the de facto partnership. Okay, after saying that, the question is what kind of model can we really set up considering the fact that there is no, like, okay, except in some US states, uh, except in some very rare countries, we don't really have like a, a DAO, like legal entity, right? It does not exist. So in France, since let's say from few years, I would say from three to five years, we're trying to look for a model which is the, the most adaptable model, according to the fact that of course it's not perfect because it was not uh, like set up for that purpose. And in France, one of the model which is the most used now is the combination between or a foundation, which is very rare, but sometimes it's happened, especially a foundation in, in Switzerland, or an association and a company. Actually, the association hosts the protocol and the company is only dedicated to the founders of the DAO. So you have like a non-profit organization and a profit company which are actually living together. Um, but <laughs> there are a lot of risks by doing some kind of combination, especially from the tax perspective. In order, you, you, you know, and, and Sherwin will explain that much better than I do, but you need to be amazingly careful, of course, from like regarding the business relationship between the commercial entity and the non-commercial entity. Because this is the point, is to set up a non-commercial entity and actually to use the commercial one in order to actually making business with a non-profit, then it's a problem. So you can do it, but you need to be really careful. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, as for like the risks uh, when choosing uh, like a legal wrapper for the DAO, we have either, um, as I know explained, uh, we can choose a mod like a pre-existing uh, company model, and the model that is really popular right now in France is to have like an association, which is a non-profit organization and a commercial company, and to kind of uh, put the protocol and, and the project in the uh, non-profit uh, association and have all of the developers and the managers as partners in the commercial company. And uh, the reasoning behind this type of uh, structuring is to say that everything that happens in the association, like everything that happens in the protocol, if we do an ICO, we have like some funds, we're not going to be taxed because we are under this umbrella of a, a non-profit association. The problem is in tax law in, Fran in France, it does not uh, suffice to have an, a non-profit organization declared to be shielded from a tax liability. Actually, what happens is if certain conditions are met in an, a non-profit uh, association, this non-profit association is going to be uh, treated from a tax point of view exactly like a commercial uh, company. So, uh, and, and one of those uh, conditions is that the association has a privileged privileged uh, liaisons and, or like dealings with a commercial company, which is exactly what happens in this model. We have uh, on the one hand an association that has a protocol, on the other have, uh, hand we have the commercial company which has all of the uh, founders and all of the developers. So the association is going to be uh, privilege, privileging working with the commercial company for, for its like developing the protocol, for its dealings, etc. So we have this uh, uh, like um, privilege um, relationship that is established and in that case uh, the association is going to revert to having to pay taxes and the problem is well for once we have we are not we're not going to be uh, exonerated from taxes as we wished and the second problem is an association is unlike a commercial company it cannot distribute benefits and it cannot distribute assets so it's a lose-lose situation for the for the protocol, uh, the founders, because on the one hand, they are going to be ta pay taxes as if they were in a commercial company. On the other hand, they are not going to be able to benefit actually from the appreciation of the of the act of, of the of their protocol of their work, and they are not going to be able to distribute benefits directly uh, from the association. So this model is only to be privileged if we actually have a, a non-profit uh, uh, 
project. Like the, the founders are really wanting to put this project forward. They are not looking at, at it as a commercial uh, exploitation, as someone to gain profits from, but they are actually doing for the benefit of the community and they can be remunerated, obviously, in a, a non-profit organization, but it's a, a capped remuneration. So they should be really careful uh, about this type of structuring. Uh, the other risk, and I don't know if we should touch on that right now or, or maybe later, is uh, an offshore uh, structuring. Oh, you can, you can go on. You can go okay, on. so the other type of risk that we see is, uh, well, the founders are going to say, well, we're going to look for an offshore uh, country or like a foreign country uh, because it's more tax uh, crypto friendly, it's more tax lenient, etc. And we are going to register our uh, legal entity there. And what happens is, uh, well, the tax uh, administration in France has actually uh, a really special power that it can say, uh, well, this company that is registered uh, outside of France actually has more ties with France than with the company of regist registration, and therefore it should be taxed in France. So we can have a foreign registered company that is taxed in France on its activity. So what are the conditions? Again, we have like several conditions and if one of them is met, we have this characterization of what we call like a, a stable entity in France. Uh, so some of those conditions are having the management actually here in France, having employees here in France, having offices in France, or having a part of the activity that is uh, conducted in France. So like negotiations, signing of the contract, etc. So once we have one of these conditions met, the tax administration in France is going to say, well, part or all of the benefits uh, realized by this foreign company is actually going to be taxed in France. And based on that, we have two uh, really risky consequences. Well, first, we have the CIT, like the company income tax uh, in France, which is 15% up to 40, 43,000 uh, euros and 25% above, that is going to be uh, applied on the benefits of the company. And not only that, but the administration can go back 10 years. So it's a, like a very major risk. And there are also interests and penalties that are applied. The second risk is for VT, which is um, like a subject that is, not, is really not uh, touched on a lot uh, when we ta we're talking about crypto, because some crypto activities are actually liable to VT. They are subject to VT. And what happens is when we have a, 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 an, a stable entity that is declared in France by the tax administration, this stable entity is going to be considered that it has not collected its due VT. Uh, and the tax administration is going to calculate it for it and it's going to uh, consider that it should pay up to 10 years back and also with interest and also with penalties. So it's really, really risky to uh, declare a foreign entity without first making sure that all of the ties uh, that can actually characterize a, a permanent or a, a stable entity in France are all cut, they are all neutralized. It's not sufficient to uh, actually just have uh, everything in place in the other country. We actually have to make sure that there are no risks uh, of a stable entity in France. Thank you very much. That was quite detailed, actually. I hope you didn't get lost in the explanation. But this kind of reflects how difficult it is to manage DAO and the structure of the DAO across different countries. Now we've heard from Arno and Sherin on how you can actually deploy your DAO in France and the, the, the tax landscapes and the risks to consider. I would like to go back now to Sabine to understand the model she talked about uh, with regards to Maverick DAOs. Could you please uh, shine some yes, light on that? Yes, just a question to the... Uh, to everybody, I think that you see the complexity of um, Web3, who want to do it the same, that Web2, and uh, I think the spirit of Web3 is not exactly what we described, because I think that the link between the new model, between the token, between uh, it's, it's a new model for a new economy, for a new contributive economy. So I think that definitely Koala model is, um, is um, an example to illustrate what is the, um, a new model, what we can 
uh, explain what we uh, who avoid uh, the cow between web two and web three. I think it's very interesting to together to to define a new uh, real world uh, with the spirit of Web3. And uh, I think that in the purpose of the model law, the body of uh, Koala model is to aim to establishing a legal statute for DAO, okay? And it's, um, it's uh, the, the idea, the central point, is um, to, to, to have attention about a concept of functional and regulatory equivalence, okay? Functional is like DocuSign. You know now DocuSign is like a signature and it's functional equivalent than the law, okay? And um, the regulatory equivalence Blockchain is a register and is the same that um, uh, infograph <laughs> is the same. You know, it's regulatory equivalent. So the, the working group try to understand the, the, the Web3 spirit and to adjust the methodology uh, with the equivalence to, to, to help uh, and to have a, a, a legal statute, you understand? And I think it's a um, very important uh, um, new methodology to respect uh, the Web3 spirit. Yeah. So thank you. So um, if I understood you correctly, uh, when you talk about the central concepts of functional and regulatory equivalence, yeah. Um, you, you, you mean that we can extrapolate from what exists today in traditional Web 2 landscape and yeah. find a way of incorporating that into Web 3 yes. uh, in application to DAOs? Yes, so it's an innovative methodology to, to, to have a bridge with the regulatory classic and the regulatory uh, uh, with the Web 3 spirit. So I think uh, that we have so much regulatory regulation, so much, so much, and for a good democracy, we need to have a new model of governance to implement in the smart contract governance with a human on the loop, like a lawyer, uh, perhaps. Uh, we, it's very important to have lawyer in the loop, but I think we can build a web three spirit with the, with this with the guarantee yeah okay thank you very much i understand this is a research topic uh, yeah. it, it's quite deep quite technical but when it comes to the practicals when it comes to the nitty gritties um, how is it possible for us to organize a dao around this new model that you're talking about okay so you, i i i i say to you that you need to go to the koala model uh, it's uh, in. Uh, it's uh, we can find. We yeah. Uh, and uh, now is fin we fin finalize this uh, this redaction and uh, the koala model can be able to to regulate it, the DAO. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that there are some uh, jurisdictions that are actually be, uh, ins being inspired by the yeah, Koala Swiss, model. Yeah, Swiss. Yeah. yeah. The Swiss now integrate um, uh, Koala model uh, to, to DAO model law. And it's very interesting, yes, Sherry, because it's when you are a DAO model law, you are limited liab liability for your company. Okay, so it's totally innovative, and uh, it's uh, and we can introduce a mechanism of uh, dispute resolution too, and there are a lot of uh, article, and you can implement and you can implement in your smart contract of governance the model of Koala. Yeah, so it's very interesting, and we can have discussed in with champagne.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Sharon, you had some comments about this uh, new structure uh, in Switzerland. Do you? Uh, well, yeah, actually, I, well, regarding the Koala model, I think the most interesting uh, thing yeah. that they are doing uh, with this model is that they are actually building uh, or like um, pointing out some administrative obsolescence. They are saying, well, now we have this technology that is a blockchain. We do not need to go through all of these administrative uh, hurdles exactly. to declare a company. Yeah. Or make sure that everything is authentic, etc. Yeah. So I think that this is a, a really, really interesting point about the koala model. And but the one thing that I was talking yeah, to yeah. Sabine outside is uh, regarding the tax uh, part. It's yeah. not like uh, developed or it's not completed uh, as much yet because uh, the problem with taxes. Um, it, it's it's is that a state. It's, yeah, exactly. State it's very problem. state oriented, and <laughs> yeah. each jurisdiction is gonna have uh, the the need or the the uh, yeah the need to to tax or to attract to say or well this is my jurisdiction I need to tax it and I think that this is the point that is gonna be a little more difficult to uh, manage with uh, like a, a model yeah. that is applicable to a lot of uh, or like internationally. Yes, and we can add just that uh, now DAO, um, it's uh, current constitute uh, uh, very similar to a trust. So I think it's very interesting and in, in with the tax uh, model, we can uh, uh, compare the methodology of trust at, that, at this time to the trust conv convention. Yeah, uh, and... What me, we might have to like keep in mind is that uh, in France, a trust is a, a, re a relatively recent uh, organization yeah. uh, because uh, like France uh, tax administration in France and, and legislators are really wary of this type of, of structuring because they think that it's like a more of a tax heaven. So it's really. Um, it's more recent, it's approached with a lot of uh, precautions, and this is why that I think that maybe uh, it's, it, it, we need to have this uh, pragmatic approach when yeah. it comes to taxes, depending on each state needs, but also have this security, which is a really difficult equation to have. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and and I, maybe... I some comments? It, it's so just, I just want to add that uh, for the trust, we, we must applicable to DAO the rule of private international law and its uh, same approach should be adopted. Yeah. I actually just wanted to add the fact that um, um, I was saying that we are actually looking for, at least in France, to model which really is the, suits the best to the structuration of the DAO. And it's interesting that you are talking about the trust because here in, in, in France we have what we call fiducie. Yeah. which is actually something, which is not the trust, but the, the ID is pretty much the same. I will not explain it right now, but it's, it's very common in some point. And um, with, uh, with Revo and with Shirin, we, we set up, let's say, like a superstructure uh, specialized in tax and law regarding especially DAO and structuration of the DAO. And we are actually looking for new models. And Fiducy is potentially part of these new models because we consider that it could be potentially the best, uh, the most suitable model of the DAO before maybe one day we really set up a specific model for it. So just for the information, because you were talking about the trust, yeah. and I think it was interesting to specify. Yeah, and just to add, I have a student who, who realized a memory about DAO and which model, uh, maybe so company, or I don't know. And now the research is ab about contra organization. So maybe I think it's a, it's a new new thing. Uh, maybe. That will be a contra-organization. Thank you very much. Uh, quite interesting. Um, the next question I wanted to talk about is, uh, or I would say subject, is about the risks of uh, decentralized finance. Um, I would direct this question to Anu. Um, could you talk about the risk of decentralized governance, uh, sorry, not finance, decentralized governance uh, in France, and if possible, on the international scene, if you have some range on that? Sure. Um, Okay, um, I would say that the risks are potentially international. I, I'm not saying that they are French especially. Um, well, um, the first is, of course, a technical risk, uh, but I think it's pretty logic what I'm saying because it's a smart contract and 
and the story of the AO proves that technical risk is probably one of the most important risks we can have in this ecosystem. Um, the legal, the compliance risk is a risk because, as we said earlier, uh, if you don't have any structure, it could be requalified as a de facto partnership and then it could have a lot of consequences for you. Of course, regulatory. And probably another one as well. Um, well, you didn't ask us exactly what is a DAO and how we consider DAO exactly, but for me, from my perspective, okay, um, I, I would say, no, it's, it's just mine, so I, I know we have like plenty of different appreciation of what yeah, is a DAO and what, yeah. what we are looking for, but me, you know, when, when the first time I heard about DAO, I was actually fascinated about the, the potentiality to to be really innovative if the, in the governance, in the way to really, let's say, like give back the power to the people, right? It's, yeah. it's, I think it's, the, it's, it's structurally why the blockchain is here, at least for me. And, and then I was really curious to, to understand the potentially the cross between the, the sociology, the politic, and the way to, to integrate a new possibility to, to, to create like a really pure governance, let's say. And, and actually, I, I would say that it's, it's um, I mean, DAO is really a, a huge potential, but at the same time, you, you and, and it's the, I would say that it's, it's, it's something logic, but in some DAO, you finally see what you want to avoid uh, in the DAO itself, which means that, um, I mean, for example, the tokens. If you have some people who actually get more than 50% of the number of the tokens, you perfectly know that potentially, according to the structuration of the, of the governance, they can, like, let's say, influ on the, on the direction of the DAO, taking some decisions, the, like, let's say, the other part doesn't want. And I would say that one of the risks for me is to, is the fact that, as we say in France, l'enfer le, est pavé de bonnes intentions, which means that you want to do very good things, you want to give back the power to the people, and at the end of the process, let's say, as in, in, in some political parties, you want to say that you are the best democracy ever, but actually you understand that it's worse uh, than some other parties when actually they don't pretend the same. You know? So I would say that for me it's one of the biggest risks of the DAO. Thank you. Uh, do you have any uh, additions uh, to that, Shane? Yeah, I, I would uh, say that for me, like whenever I'm talking to uh, someone who wants to create a DAO or like a, create a, a DAO and the legal entity for a DAO, the first question that that I ask is why? Why do you want to cre create the DAO? Uh, because when we know the the objective of the DAO, we can understand then the need and uh, like the actual liability that can. Uh, uh, ensue from from this DAO because uh, like a, a really interesting read that I that I, I had uh, was um, uh, a blog post that was published by Vitalik in, in 2016 and it actually talks about how uh, Bitcoin is actually a DAO so we see that uh, like a DAO is, can be actually something that is completely decentralized and working without having any sort of management any sort of liability behind it etc and so it's uh, and, and then we see like it, it like the DAOs evolved after that and we have uh, DAOs that are more uh, uh, like they they look more like a, a a regular corporation, uh, like a, a regular commercial or legal corporation, and which is a really completely different model of governance. So it's so important to understand the, the reasoning behind the creation of the DAO and the powers that are going to be attributed to the members, to the founders, uh, and the, the part of the project that is going to be realized through the DAO to understand uh, first the legal implications of it, if we need to have a legal wrapper or no, what type of legal wrapper. So earlier today we were, talk we were critiquing in, in a sort uh, some types of, of organization but what we wanted actually to say is that it really depends on each project. There is not one size fits all um, because it's a recent and evolving co concept and we, we see uh, like the creativity of the, the founders uh, where we have like really different types of, of models of governance, really different types of projects. And this is why we have to have this pragmatic approach and see what the actual needs are, what the actual project is, to be able to uh, have this legal type of shield or legal type of entity that, go that goes with it. Yeah. 
thank you very much. Um, I just have one last question for you, Sherin. Um, should airdrops be taxed? And if yes, how are they taxed? Uh, well, airdrops. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to airdrops to contributors, to DAO contributors yeah. or founders. Yeah. Uh, well, airdrops, uh, much like DAO, is not a, a legally recognized concept. There is no uh, legal definition. Uh, there are no legal, um, like, um, yeah, equivalents. So what we do when we have like a concept or an operation that is not legally predefined, it doesn't mean that it is outside of the realm of the law, that it, the law doesn't apply to it. It actually means that we have to have this effort uh, to qualify it from a legal standpoint with uh, the pre-existing rules that we have. So what we do is we actually have to look at what happens. Uh, why is this airdrop being uh, made? So if it's actually an airdrop that is a sort of a, um, like a, we are distributing benefits and the members, their contribution is buying the tokens and then uh, the DAO is actually engaging to uh, distribute a percentage of the benefits each year or each, like whatever the rhythm uh, that is used. So in that case, we might have a qualification of what we call in France, a revenu de capital mobilier, which is a form of um, like a financial product that is being received by the by the uh, members and it's going to be taxed accordingly so we have uh, a flat tax which is not the flat tax that is applied to uh, the capital gains on cryptos it's actually a different type of flat tax it's also 30 percent it just has uh, different rules uh, which means it's at the moment that the person receives the uh, the, the financial reward uh, that is taxed even if they do not con convert it into um, fiat money or like legal money uh, and this is like really important to keep in mind because even if the crypto loses in value or like the tokens lose in value at the moment of the conversion it doesn't mean that we are going to adjust the tax liability because it's like it's determined at the moment of the reception if on the contrary uh, like it's an airdrop where, where we have like a completely uh, like uh, it's not uh, a definite operation, it's not an actual uh, financial uh, contribution or reward, I'm sorry, but it's like a, an, like a communication uh, operation where we're, we're like just dropping tokens to uh, enhance the image of the project and to have people talking on uh, social media and they are actually um, not, um, like it's not in the, in the same um, financial um, investment kind of uh, spirit. Uh, in that case, we can have, we can consider actually that this airdrop is completely non-taxed because it's just like a gift and a gift is not uh, taxed from a legal point of view. So it's actually really important to, uh, sorry? Yeah, it depends. Yeah, it, it, it's, it depends because it's yeah. not a predefined concept. So we have yeah. to be, uh, to qualify it from, with the things that we are already have in place. You had some comments, uh, Arno? No, okay. I think so uh, th thanks a lot, uh, all three of you. Um, we are approaching the end of this session, but I still have some other questions which are kind of more hands on the ground, boots on the ground, practical kind of questions. So uh, you have a developer that works with a DAO, but he's based in France, and the DAO is based in another country, let's say Switzerland, for example. Uh, at the start of the contract, the developer accepts payments in crypto, but we understand there are market cycles. You have the bull cycle, the bear cycle. Um, and during the bear cycle, you understand like um, the value of tokens drop at least 70, 75, 80%. This developer decides that he wants his payments in fiat and not crypto. Are there any things to consider from the tax perspective, from the legal perspective, I would say, because this is way more interesting. Uh, you used to pay out in tokens, and now you have to pay out in fiat. So that takes some degree of accounting that has to be done in-house. Uh, how do you navigate this landscape? Um, okay, so, well, yeah. just it's a question on-chain. On-chain is no tax. Uh, uh, well, actually, yeah. there is uh, something that is really yeah. important to uh, distinguish because mm -hmm. we, like, I see this confusion all of the time. Yeah. Uh, whenever I'm talking to a person and they tell me, uh, "Well, we have, we made this project, we uh, 
like sold some NFTs, I did some uh, services to a protocol and got uh, paid, but it's all in crypto. I didn't convert to Fiat, so I'm not concerned with taxes for the moment. This is not correct. Actually, there is a specific regime that only applies to people who uh, are trading in crypto as individuals for their uh, private estate. And those people that buy and sell crypto are the only people concerned with the exoneration on uh, crypto to crypto exchanges. Yeah. So if you are buying crypto for, with your own money and, you, and it's like you're not a professional trader, you're just buying, like making some investments, you're then selling your Bitcoins to, uh, to another uh, XRP or whatever, and then you are selling to another token or you're buying NFTs, even if the NFT's qualification is at the moment a, a bit like not clear, but whatever. Like w when you st when you stay in crypto to crypto exchanges and you are like a, an investor, a, a per, uh, like a uh, an investor that is not a professional, here you are exonerated from taxes. You do not pay any taxes on this crypto to crypto exchanges, and you're only taxed when you when you convert to fiat. But if you receive a crypto as a form of payment, like you created a token, you created an NFT, you um, did a service to a protocol and you got paid in crypto, in that case, it does, the exoneration doesn't apply. You actually pay taxes at the moment of the reception of the crypto, at the value of the cryptos at this moment. So even like I did a service, I, I'm a lawyer, and I had like someone who, who paid me in crypto for like a, a, a consultation that I made. It's at the moment that they are going to pay me that I am going to be ta liable to taxes at this crypto and at the value that I received it at, at this moment. So if I decided to keep this crypto because I said, okay, I got paid, I'm going to keep this crypto because I, I ho I'm hoping that it appreciates in value. And then the next year, when I actually have to pay my taxes on the last year, uh, this crypto lost in value. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to have to pay taxes at the same amount that I received it at. I'm actually also going to have to pay VET on the amount because I'm, I'm, I'm subject to VET. So it's really, yeah. really important to not consider just because you're receiving your remuneration in crypto that you are not being taxed. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, okay. Very understood. Um, I think we're going to round up very soon, but I just have one final question based on what you said. So the moment you receive payments in crypto, you oh, get taxed. It's a personal consultation or it's personal? <laughs> <laughs> joking, I'm joking. So <laughs> I have the feeling that it's a mix of both. <laughs> um, so basically, you're being taxed on the value you receive, we have right? MetaMask. Okay, but it kind of sounds unfair that you're being taxed on the fiat value of the crypto you receive and not on the crypto value itself. So for example, I receive 10 Bitcoin as payment. I'm meant to be taxed in Bitcoin terms and not in fiat terms. So my question is, um, why is it the case that I have to be taxed in the fiat value of the crypto I receive, knowing full well that crypto is very volatile? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question and we have to understand that in France, uh, like the only legal currency is euro. So this is why we always refer to euro. And we're, when we are talking about cryptos, we actually, from a tax standpoint, uh, we kind of uh, have the same reasoning as we would have if we have like a, another um, like material or currency or even um, a good. Like if I get paid, uh, like I did a consultation and one of my clients decided to pay me in a really nice Rolex, for instance. Am I going to pay my taxes as a part of the Rolex? No, I'm actually going to pay it as the uh, like money uh, and, and specifically your equivalent of the, this like value of the Rolex that I received. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so that concludes it. But before we go, we just want one final word from uh, all three of the speakers on the future perspectives of uh, DAO and also legal uh, management and tax perspective as well. So just uh, one final note from all of you and then we'll round up the session. Okay. Just uh, I want to add something that if you choose um, a tech model, I think it's a politic model. <laughs> because uh, it's a new model of governance, so uh, you know the the aim to uh, the aim to create Web three that will be a new model, a new economy, 
uh, with a pillar of uh, regulation, of justice, of uh, economy, of new money. And uh, definitely, I want that we can build a digital democracy. Uh, well, I, I would say like something that I already said during the intervention is that not because uh, it's something that is not legally defined yet, that it's outside of the realm of the law. We always have to make this effort to uh, qualify each transaction, each operation, each like good or, or like uh, thing that we make from a legal standpoint. Uh, and there are no like one model fits all for what's happening happening in the ecosystem because it's always evolving there is a lot of creativity people are doing things their own way so we cannot copy paste uh, legal or uh, like so, tax solutions from another project or another person uh, because it really is really subjective and it depends on the on each person on well, um, <laughs> it's, it's a quick, it's, yeah, right. Um, I would just say that, um, you know, now in Europe, there is a new regulation for crypto assets. Um, we are like thinking that potentially Europe will regulate the DeFi very soon, probably in the next from two to five years, I would say the maximum. And I think, I hope they would think about uh, when they will regulate the DeFi, they are going to have to regulate the DAO as well, at least to set up set up a model, it's maybe very ambitious, but at least some rules to like uniformize a bit the situation, because as I, yeah, exactly, thank you, maybe, hello, Koala, maybe, I don't know, but anyway, the point is like, um, regulation is not always the best, but at least the biggest advantage of regulation is stability, and in order to develop our ecosystem, we need stability, so hopefully it's gonna come. Yes. Thank you. And just add a new method. It's, uh, you can uh, check. It's um, sandbox regulatory. I think it's very interesting. Now the European Commission has a big sandbox regulatory about blockchain. And that will be the uh, good way to emerge a good regulation, and not so much regulation. And that is a balance between innovation and regulation. And that will be a very uh, specific way with uh, sandbox with the tech and lawyer. Yeah. Thank you very much. And that wraps it up. Uh, a big round of applause to our speakers, uh, Shirin, Arno, and Sabine. Uh, thanks a lot for listening, and we hope to see you soon. If you have any questions, you can approach any of the speakers after this session to ask your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.